know, in my time at this church, I have learned a lot of good things about preaching. As I've listened to the pastors as they preach here, I've learned that it's good to prepare a document of what you're preaching out so that people can see that and understand it and get it. Didn't do that. <laughs> I've also learned that it's good to create a PowerPoint so that all the verses that you're reading or any, or any um, things that people have said, any quotes that have been said, that it would be good to have them up on PowerPoint. Didn't do that. But, but one thing I did learn, I also learned, and, and Pastor Michael, thank you very much, I learned that when you come on stage and you're not Dave, you say, I'm not Dave. <laughs> I'm not Dave. <laughs> Nailed it! <laughs> Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this time when we can come before your word, come before you by your Holy Spirit and learn what you have to teach us. I pray, O oh Lord, that you would not let me get in the way, but that you would proclaim your truth to this congregation of people and that by your proclamation of truth, that lives would be changed and that people would follow you better than they have before. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this passage that's helping me follow you better than I have before. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This past week in Libya, over 5,000 people died in flooding. Previous week, over 2,900 people died in an earthquake in Morocco. Firestorm in Maui a little while ago killed at least 115 people. And there have been 29 school shootings so far, at least of my last count this year. In 2022, Three UGA players, University of Georgia football players, were killed. And at that funeral, C.C. Winans got up and sang that song that we just sang together, Goodness of God. She sang the goodness of God at a funeral, and Jesus did not show up and raise those three young men back to life. When death is always outside your window, when death is at your very doorstep, how do we claim God is good? In fact, one of the arguments against God is that you Christians say that God is good and you also say that God is all-powerful. Yet I see all this evil in the world. Now, either your God is not all good, or he's not all-powerful, or maybe this God of yours is just in your imagination. Jesus spoke to that. In this story that you heard so beautifully read, thank you readers, Jesus spoke to that. He said, I am indeed all-powerful. And if I choose to allow evil, such as death, I have a good reason for it, even if you don't understand it yet. The raising of Lazarus is the last of the seven miraculous signs that we see in the book of John. The first one was back in chapter 2. Remember what that was? Turning the water into wine? Yeah. 
First one was at a wedding celebration. The last one was at a funeral. But isn't that how the stages of life often are? You begin with celebration, and it ends with a funeral or with some kind of tragedy, some kind of loss. Start off with a wedding, with the birth of a child, and we end at a funeral of a spouse, a funeral of a parent, maybe worst of all that I can imagine, the, the funeral of a child. But you see, Jesus steps into that equation, and he messes up the answer. It's not one celebration and then one funeral, one minus one equals zero. He takes that zero, flips it on his side, twists it, and says it's infinity. <laughs> he does something different. Usually when I start a message, I start off with a sermon and a sentence. And this will be <laughs> what I will do here again this morning, a sermon and a sentence. And that sermon and a sentence, the point of that is for you to know where I'm going understand the message, and so that if you fall asleep, you'd still leave here with something. <laughs> the sermon in the sentence is this. The Lord is the shepherd. And even when he chooses not to shelter his sheep from death, they follow him. He is their life. The Lord is the shepherd, and even when he chooses not to shelter his sheep from death, they follow him. He is their life. Now, pretty much every single preacher that gets up, at least in this church, there is something that they want to happen. They're teaching for a reason. There is a desire that they want for their congregation by the time they finish their message and say amen. They want something. I'm going to tell you what I want. My desire is not that you just say the Lord is the shepherd. My desire is that you personalize this and you say the Lord is the my shepherd. And even when he chooses not to shelter me from death, I will follow him. He is my life. So we're going to look at three things when we look at this passage. We're going to see that Jesus is the Lord. We're going to see that Jesus is indeed the good shepherd. And we're going to see that Jesus claims to be and is life. Jesus is Lord. What does a Lord do? What is a Lord? Lord is one who controls a vast property usually land of some sort. He looks out over that land and he must make sure that it functions properly. He's got control over this property. And so he says, I need to make sure that no matter what happens, everything works out. He's got the long view. He's got the long view. He wants not at, you know, just every little thing to work out right, but he wants the whole thing to work out right. He's got an idea that it matters what happens at the end. The ultimate focus is the forest and not just the individual tree. Jesus is the Lord, not only of just a vast property, but the entire universe. The end state is what matters. And sometimes in that end state, there's disaster. 
there's trouble. Sometimes there are lots of requests to a Lord, and he has to manage those requests and all the different things that come with that. And sometimes he has to decide if, when, and how to respond to requests. Jesus is that kind of Lord. Lazarus' family was praying for him. Mary was praying. Martha was praying. They got their friends to pray. Everybody was praying for Lazarus. And they did the best thing that they could do. They got a messenger to go to Jesus and say, the one that you love is ill. But in verse five, verses 5 two through 6, in John chapter 11, he says, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. The family was praying. God heard, but they did not get the response that they wanted. They didn't hear Be there in a jiff, going to solve your problem right away. They were going to find out that when he did respond, it was better than they could have ever imagined. But that was not yet. That was not yet. They had to wait. Now, the initial reason that Jesus stated, you know, he said in verse 4, it is for the glory of God that the Son of God may be glorified through it. He said, this illness is not to death. Now, whether Mary and Martha got that message, I'm not sure. It's quite possible that they got that message, that when the, the person, the messenger was there and he delivered that message, that God, that Jesus said to his disciples and he said to the messenger, you know what, this is not to death. This is not to death. This is for the Son of God to be glorified. Maybe they heard it, maybe they didn't. But the one thing that we do know is that the disciples heard it. And it's the very same thing that Jesus said when he opened the eyes of the blind man, that this illness, this blindness is not because of somebody's sin. It's not unto death. It is so that God would be glorified. Now, Jesus chooses not to answer a prayer so God would be glorified. Really? I thought that, you know, when, when Christians, we pray, right? And we, we pray, can I have this, Lord? And God says, yes, you can have it. And it's like, praise God. You get glo- doesn't God get glory from that? Sure he does. But sometimes the greater glory comes from not answering the prayer. When we, at the time or in the way that we expect it. And that was in this case. The glory of God is the ultimate. What brings us the most joy as believers is oftentimes not what we think will bring us the most joy. But when we see God glorified in the way that he chooses to glorify himself, there is great joy. So how do we respond when the answer of the Lord is no? Because until it happens, a not yet feels a whole lot like a no. Do we still trust God? In the no. Do we still trust God in the no? Oftentimes also, a Lord has to decide what is best and organize things in a way for the best thing to occur despite the seeming tragedies along the way. In John eleven fourteen 14b to 15a, Jesus says this, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe. Jesus allowed evil for the sake of good. 
That's what a Lord does. See, belief in Jesus is more valuable than being sheltered from death. You see, you've heard it from the beginning of this series of messages. The Gospel of John, life in his name. You heard it from the very beginning. Pastor Dave is harping on John 20, 31. John 20, 31, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. We've heard that over and over and over for what, about 26 sermons. Heard that, that in believing you may have life in His name. Why does John keep, why is John's focus on that? You know why John is focused on that? Because Jesus is focused on that. He got that from Jesus. And Jesus says that even if someone has to die, it is better for that person to die. It is better for their family to weep that folks would believe in him. Because that belief in Jesus Christ brings life that does not end. That belief brings life that overwhelms death. And that was the point. I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe. He allows grief and sorrow and evil so that something better can come out. Some of you may have heard of Johnny Erickson Tata. She is a woman who at the age of 17 had a diving accident, messed up her spine, and became a quadriplegic. She's been a quadriplegic, one of the longest living quadriplegics. She's been around now for 56 years as a quadriplegic. When she was in the middle of her recovery, a friend of hers named Steve said something to her when she was completely depressed. She didn't want to go on. She wanted to commit suicide, but as a quadriplegic, she didn't have the ability to do so. And her friend Steve said this, God permits what he hates to accomplish that which he loves And she's been saying those 10 words ever since. She says this, God permits what he hates to accomplish what he loves. What does that mean to you and me? Although God takes no joy in hardships and afflictions, he nevertheless ordains who will be touched by suffering and how much. And although we may not understand his purposes at first, it is always for our good and his glory. And so it gives me immense comfort knowing that my loving God wrote affliction into the script of my life. And after more than half a century living in a wheelchair, I wouldn't have it any other What if the purpose of your pain is for the glorification of God? Is your pain worth it? If you believe that the purpose of your pain was for the glorification of God, would it cause the way that you responded to that pain, would it cause you to respond differently? Do you curse God for it or bless him in it? Will it cause you to feel that pain any less? Probably not. Will it enable you to bear that pain any better? Probably so. How would it cause you to engage with others about that pain? 
if you knew that through your life, through the way that you responded to that pain, it might help other people see Jesus better? Would it make a difference? When you are a believer, your response to every pain and every pleasure reveals who you believe God is and what you believe about God. Every pain and every pleasure. Your response reveals who you believe God is. It reveals what you think His character is. Whether it's a paper cut or a really good cup of coffee, your response to that reveals what you believe about God. Whether it's a cancer diagnosis or a wedding, how you respond to that reveals what you believe about God. As Pastor Dave says, it matters. It matters. It matters. Now, I'm not saying that we have to fake it. No, we don't fake it. But in the middle of sorrow, there is joy. In the middle of sorrow, there can be joy. What was Job's response to trial? He said in Job 42, 5, I heard you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Suffering and sorrow for the believer passes through the hand of a Lord who loves us. We suffer because of love not in spite of it. We suffer because of love, not in spite of it. God seeks to show His glory, and sometimes that glory can only be really seen through tears. Jesus did not exempt Himself from this. If you think He's just playing chess with your life, remember that the king also died. The king also suffered violently. He himself endured pain for this greater glory or good. Hebrews 12, 2. Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Permanent joy is worth temporary pain. Now, how do people respond to that lordship? You know, there, um, when Jesus came and he w- went to this funeral, he was outside of town. They were sitting what's called Shiva. Sitting Shiva means it's the seven days of Jewish mourning. So they are saying they're not bathing, um, frankly, just mourning over the loss. And people are coming in from town. There there are people coming in from Jerusalem, which is two miles away. And they are spending that time there with them mourning. Now, when Martha hears, hears that Jesus has come, she runs out. And her response when she gets to Jesus is, Lord, if you had been here, our brother would not have died. But even so, I know that the Lord will do, that God will do whatever you ask. Now, is she saying that I know the Lord will do, I know that God will do whatever you ask? Is it because she thinks that he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead? Probably not. When Jesus says he's going to rise again, she says, I know it's going to happen in the resurrection. She's thinking, way in the future, not now. But what does it mean that she says, even now I know 
that God will listen to you and do whatever you ask. It's character. She sees Jesus' character. It is the kind of character that says, God knows you and the kind of person you are, and so he does the things that you ask. She says, I know your character. I still trust you. She didn't say, why didn't you do this? You should have been here. You should have saved his life. She says the truth. If you were here, you would have saved him. He would still be alive. But I still trust you. When Mary came, Jesus sends Martha. Martha goes and gets Mary. Mary comes. She says the exact same words. If you had been here, my brother would still be alive. Does she say, I trust you? Yes, she does. How does she do it? On her knees. Before him, worshiping him as Lord. Her body position says, I trust you. You are Lord. I want to be able to respond like that. Do you want to be able to respond like that? Do what pastor says. He, he continually harps on reading scripture. We've got to read scripture. We've got to be people of scripture. We've got to be people who read and read and read the scripture because in it, God speaks to us. We recognize that he is really a person and not just an idea. We do not bring or issues or sorrows or fears or hopes or dreams to an idea. We bring them to a person. You stay away from scripture. Sometimes God can just become an idea. You need scripture so that he is consistently speaking to you, so that you know he's a person, so that when these tragedies come, you can come before him and say, I trust you, Lord. Read scripture. Spend time with those who love the Lord. Go to life group. That's for you. <laughs> Go to life group. These are the things that remind you that Jesus is Lord. You've been hearing them from the time you were a, a new believer, but they are the things that help us maintain the view of the lordship and the personhood of Jesus Christ. But there were some other people who were there. Some other people who came with Mary, and, and by the way, this is important. Your response, your following of Jesus sometimes brings other people as well. When Mary came, she brought other people with her. Other people followed her. But some of those people, they said, some people said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? That but tells you where their attitude was. It wasn't that, oh, how he loved him. And like, if you really did heal that blind man, he would have been able to heal Lazarus too. Maybe he just stayed away because he couldn't do it. Maybe they were saying his priorities were off. He should have been here. They didn't trust him. They didn't trust him. That's what happens when God becomes just an idea, not a person. How do we respond? Sometimes the same event in our lives, in the lives of two different people, cause completely opposite reactions. Your position with Christ determines your reactions when the problems of life come. Got to know him. 
got to spend time with him. He's got to be your Lord. You've got to see him as, as Lord. But he's a Lord that cares about his people. Um, you've probably, you guys have probably seen my son Stefan. Some of you have. He's, he's led with the worship team sometimes. He was my toughest kid. He was just trouble, always getting into trouble. At, at times, my wife didn't know if he was going to survive too. <laughs> I, and um, he was just disobedient sometimes. But, you know, for most of my kids, I, haven't, I didn't have to spank them until, you know, after, after three years old. It was it, you know, I just, spanking was done. Didn't have to. Steph? I think he was about six years old. And I probably didn't have to spank him for a while. But he did something, and I say, no, don't do that again. He did it again. Say, don't do that again. And he did it again. (sighs) So I had to spank him. And you know how sometimes people say, this will hurt you more than it hurts me? That time it really did. I didn't want to spank my son. But what was important at that point was his character. I wanted to develop his character. I wanted him to grow up to be a guy who knew what was right and what was wrong. The character was important. The end result was important. So I spanked him. But while I was spanking him, I was crying more than he was. I didn't want to do it. But the character was important. But the heart of dad didn't want to see the pain. I, I, I asked him yesterday, can I share the story? He said, I, I don't remember it. He doesn't remember the pain, but the character remains. That's what God seeks to do with us. That's what God seeks to do with us. But it doesn't stop him, just like me, about caring about that pain in the middle of the pain. See, we see that Jesus is Lord, but Jesus is also shepherd. Jesus is the good shepherd. And when we think of the good shepherd, there's a picture that we have in our minds. We we don't think oftentimes of the shepherd leading the whole flock. We think of him with the individual sheep. We think of him going out, leaving the 99 and going and finding that one lost sheep and picking him up and putting him on, on his shoulders and walking with him. This is what Jesus did with the imagery that he gave us in the Bible about caring about that one sheep. See, Jesus is Lord, he cares about the forest. Jesus is shepherd, he cares about the tree. We see that he cares about the tree. He loves his sheep. The shepherd loves his sheep. Verse 3, so the sister sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. Verse 5, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. There was no question about the relationship that Jesus had with Lazarus Martha and Mary. No questions. The family knew it. The disciples knew it. John wrote it. In John 10, 14, we see the relationship between the good shepherd and the sheep. He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. That word know is of intimate relationship. It talks about love. He cares for his sheep. 
He cares for his sheep individually, and he cares about their well-being, and he cares about their pain. He is angered when his sheep are hurt. You heard the reading this morning. In, in some of the other scriptures, it says he was deeply moved. You heard it in the New Living Translation this morning. He was angry. Why was Jesus angry? He is the good shepherd. He says, Satan only comes to kill, steal, and his destroy. We, we heard that. I think Michael spoke about that earlier in chapter 10. This idea about the, sh- sh- the good shepherd, we heard so much about it in chapter 10. And so, Jesus hates it when someone comes to steal, kill, or destroy his sheep. You know, also, John wrote this in 1 John. He says, in, John chapter, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, it says, The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. What's the work of the devil? Sin, right? What does James say about sin in verse 15? He says that sin, when it is fully grown, it brings forth death. The death that we see, the death that Jesus saw, was a result of sin. He looked at this situation and saw the pain that death and sin caused Martha, it caused Mary, it caused the people around him, and he was angry. He was angry. He was so angry that eventually he took on death, mano a mano. Death is dead. But that hadn't happened yet. It's in his character to hate the results of sin, especially in the way it causes that pain to his sheep. God cares about the pain and death of your loved ones. God cares about your pain and death. He cares. He cares. Don't think that because he doesn't fix it, at least not right away, that he doesn't care about it. We should pray for relief from pain. Sometimes God grants that. We should also pray for the strength to endure it when it comes and pray that he would be glorified through it no matter what he chooses to do. If he chooses to relieve the pain, praise God, we worship him, and tell people about it. If he chooses, however, to say, my grace is sufficient for you, my strength is made perfect in your weakness, we praise God too. And we sing the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. We sing it. We proclaim it. And you know what people will see? They will see that we serve a God that is so much more valuable than our present situation. That proclaims God. He is a shepherd. His sheep follow him. Right? His sheep follow him. That's what we learned in chapter 10. That his sheep follow him. When Jesus got into town, somehow Martha found out she ran to where he was. She followed him. She got there. When he finished talking to Martha, Martha went to the house, said, he's calling you. Mary ran there. She followed him. And people followed Mary too, which is really cool because that's how, let's go this way. At the wedding feast, the first first 
big miracle. How many people knew that Jesus had turned the water into wine? Not many. The, 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 the master of the feast had no clue. Most of the people had no few clue. The couple of disciples, a few disciples were there, and the, and the servants that, that poured it out, they knew, but pretty much nobody else knew. Because Mary followed Jesus, a whole bunch of people from Jerusalem followed as well and got to see this amazing miracle. The way that you follow matters. Because in the way that you follow, it may cause other people to see the glory of God. Be a sheep. Follow the shepherd. But you know who else followed? You know who else followed? Martha followed. Mary followed. My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. Lazarus followed. Death does not stop Jesus' sheep from following him. He says, Lazarus, come out. Lazarus, Jesus, I'm right there. He followed. And just as a note, an idea can't raise the dead. Only a person can. Jesus. Lazarus followed. And because of that, many others followed as well. Verse 45, Jesus allowed, as, as Lord, he allowed death so that a shepherd, he would cause more sheep to follow. Many followed. The idea of Jesus as a shepherd, and especially in this instance, reminds me of David. In David, we heard a story about David, about when a lion came and grabbed one of his sheep. The first thing that he did, he went to the lion and snatched the sheep out of his mouth. Do we see, do we see kind of an image of, of that with Jesus? Do we see Jesus going to the lion of death and snatching Lazarus out of his mouth? Do we see that? And, and what happened in the rest of the story with, with David and the lion? When the lion got angry and came after David, David slew the lion. Well, sometime after the story, they slew Jesus, right? Death came after Jesus. Three days later, death was dead and Jesus was alive. Now, death is a wounded lion, a dying lion. It still can scratch you. But if you are in Christ, the most that can do is put, give you a long nap. That's the most it can do. Death is dead. Those that are in Christ are alive. He says it. We talked about Jesus being Lord. We talk about him being shepherd. He also said that he was life. He sustains. Jesus said this. Uh, in the first place that we see him talking about him being life is in ch chapter 11, verse 7 through 10, at least in this passage. It says, then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were now, just now seeking to stone you. And you're going there again? Jesus answered, are they not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. When Jesus talked about the light there, 
Who's talking about himself? He is the light of the world. And if anyone walks in that light, if that light is in him, they will not die. The disciples were afraid of death. They're going to stone you. You remember just a few days ago, you claimed to be the good shepherd. You claimed that you would give life. You said that you and the Father were one. They're trying to kill you. You're going to go back there? Jesus said, you heard me before that I am the light of the world. If the light is in you, you will not stumble. You will not die. At least not fully and finally. Thomas didn't get it. He said, oh, let's go die with him. He was about to go see life instead of death. Jesus also, in this passage, also claimed to be the resurrection and proved it. Verses 21 to 27, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. When Jesus decided to stay for two more days, he showed up four days after Lazarus was dead got a math question for you. Jesus stayed two days, arrived four days after Lazarus had died. If he hadn't waited and had gone two days later, two days earlier, excuse me, would Lazarus have been alive? Four minus two is two. Four minus two is two. Lazarus would not have been alive even if Jesus went there right away. So why? If the point was they're going to see Lazarus dead. If that was the point, why didn't he just go right away? In the Jewish book of theology and history called the Talmud. It says this, the strength of mourning happens at the fourth day, at the, excuse me, at the third day, at the end of the third day, because the spirit hovers around the body until it recognizes that it starts to decay and then it leaves, right? There's no biblical basis for that, but that's what a lot of people at that time believed. So the idea was that the spirit hangs around the body for about three days. And at the fourth day is when it starts to see the face change, that, that decomposition is happening. That's it. It's over. There is no more hope. That person is deader than dead. So Jesus waited for four days. He waited for four days when there was no hope to show that there is hope in him and hope in God. He showed up and did something that no one expected could be done except if that person is God. See, when Jesus claimed to be the resurrection and the life, Jesus didn't just claim, I can raise somebody back from the dead. In the resurrection, he claimed that. He said, he, he, he raised Lazarus back to life. He said, I am the resurrection and so the resurrection, the idea of resurrection is a very physical idea, that someone comes back to life after they're dead. Jesus did not resurrect Lazarus, however. He raised him. He's been very careful 
Not to say he resurrected him. He raised him from the dead. Why? Because with resurrection, there is a transformation so that death can never occur again. Lazarus' body is dead. But he also claimed to be the life. And he said, if you are alive, and I'm going to read it exactly, the words that he says. He says this. Everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. In that sense, Lazarus is still alive. Everyone that you know that has died in Christ is alive. But Jesus said this. He said, I am the resurrection. I can pull the dead back to life, even if they've been dead for four days, four years, four hundred years, four thousand years, I've got the power to do that. He also said that I am the life, eternal life starts now if you trust me. But in saying that he is the life, he is saying no, he's saying I depend on no one or no thing for my life. I am self-existent. He says, for you, every breath that you breathe depends on me. I am the life. What is Jesus claiming when he says, I am the life? He claims to be God. Anyone who tells you that Jesus never said he was God has no clue what the Bible says. Over and over and over and over, Jesus says, I am God. And we can trust him because just like he did many other times, he says more than he does, but in his doing, he proves what he says. He says, I'm the resurrection, and he revived a man. No one else could revive a man after four days. Is he fully resurrected? No. But, like Jesus said, trust the works that you see. If they be from the Father, believe in me. We believe in Jesus because of what he has done. He proved that he is the life. He claimed to be life. He proved to be life. What does that mean to us? It means that nothing or no one else is or life. All of us hold on to things consciously or unconsciously, thinking that our lives would be over if they were gone. We think, my life would be over if I lose my job. My life would be over if I lose my health. My life would be over if I lose my spouse. My life will be over if I lose my children. But if you have Jesus, none of that is true. And the fact is that even if you lose your life, you still haven't lost it. Everything else that we have are gifts from the one who is our life. We treasure him, and we also treasure the things that, we, that he gives us. Yes, we treasure our job, we treasure our relationships, but they are gifts from him, not replacements of him. Raising Lazarus was so much less about people getting back what they lost Raising Lazarus was more of helping people to recognize who they already had or who they could have, Jesus. And your eternal life begins with him now if you believe in him. So the end of that narrative in verse 45 is beautiful and terrifying at the same time. Verse 45 says this, Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. 
Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and seen what he did, believed in him. It's beautiful that some of them saw not only a miracle, but saw a Jesus that they could trust no matter what and believed in him. Many of you in this room already do trust in him. And this story was just another of those many graces that you've received in your life that encourage you to hold on to Christ. But do you find it strange that after this never-before-seen miracle, that it doesn't say that all who saw believed in him? Doesn't it seem strange that folks could stand there and see a man called out of a grave and not believe in the one who called him out of the grave? You know, a lot of people say today, I don't believe because I don't have any evidence. They say, I'm an evidence-based person. I need to see the evidence. What this story shows is that you can have all the evidence in front of you and still not believe. The fact is that it's rarely a lack of evidence that is the issue. Issue is a hardened heart and hardened ears that potentially signify that you're not a sheep, as Pastor Dave spoke about last week. See, if you're not yet in Christ, and you look at this story, you listen to this, and you think, that's really weird that those people didn't believe, even though they had the evidence in front of you. What about you? Could it be that your heart is hardened like theirs? And even though there is evidence all around you, you choose not to believe? If that sounds scary to you, ask the Lord to soften your heart and open your ears so that you can hear and believe. If you say, I do don't want that to be me, that I can see a man raised from the dead and walk away unbelieving, God can do a miracle in you today. He can do a miracle in you today. And people are praying that right now. God can do that miracle today. It is the call of the book of John and the call of Jesus through the book of John that we believe. Is that we believe and say, the Lord is my shepherd. And even if he chooses not to shelter me from death, I will follow him. He is my life. For all of us that believe that, there's a special meal that we get to have. Because Jesus did pull Lazarus, snatch Lazarus out of the mouth of the lion. And he's also snatched us out of the mouth of the lion and he's killed the lion. Because Jesus died on the cross, we live. Here's how Paul says it. For I delivered to you as a first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, 
and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve, then appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom were still alive, though some had fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one born untimely, he appeared also to me. Paul says that of most importance, Jesus lived, he died, he rose again, he lives forever, and people saw it. And because he died, the resurrection is ours. The end is not the end for us. It is only the beginning. So for you, and I'll call the ushers, if you could bring out the elements so that um, we can have this communion meal together. And if you have been in Christ for 90 years or more, or if you just bowed to Jesus and said, you are my shepherd. I'm going to follow you no matter what. If you've been a believer for 90 seconds, this meal is for you. This meal is where we celebrate the death of the one who gives us life. We celebrate the one, the death, of the one who gave us life. Paul again in 1 Corinthians says this, for I receive from the Lord what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us drink together. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until He comes. You proclaim the death that gave us life. You proclaim the death of the Lord. You proclaim the death of the shepherd. You proclaim the death of life who killed death and is alive forevermore. And so we too will be alive forevermore with him. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are our Lord, you are our shepherd, and you are our life. In following you, O oh Lord, help us to see you for who you are and help us to follow you in a way that draws others to yourself. And O oh Lord, I pray for those in this room who may not have yet trusted. I pray that they too would claim you as Lord, shepherd, and life. And they too would be raised from the dead, raised spiritually, and one day, one day soon, to be raised physically because you are the resurrection and the life. We have put our life in your hands. And, oh, Lord, we know that your word says nothing is able to take us out of your hand. So we praise you 
and look forward to seeing you face to face. May we pray these things in you, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.